Yep. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Gabrielle, and I'm going to be discussing about um, making disaster preparedness inclusive for those with sensory needs, um, specifically with autism and ADHD. But I just want to have a disclaimer that sensory needs include like sensitivity to like sounds, bright lights, um, which are especially prevalent during natural disasters. Um, I also want to say like sensory processing issues also do occur, but they're not limited to those with autism and, AD and or ADHD. There are people with auditory processing disorder and sensory processing disorder who experience these issues as well. I'm going to be talking specifically for the case of autism and ADHD because I have personal experience with both disabilities. Um, so drawing personal experience from it. Um, so like natural disaster preparedness can be especially tricky for those with sensory issues, um, namely with um, those who have sensory issues regarding hearing, um, those who are like sensitive to like bright lights and also like other things not limited to sensory overload, but also like um, who have a really hard time adjusting to sudden changes, which is like quite prevalent with autism. Um, but it is also like common with ADHD. Um, so one of the first things to do is to like process information is to have multiple ways of processing, not just like verbal, because like some people like me have a harder time processing verbal information compared to um, like information that's presented um, like visually. So having multiple ways of communicating about like um, ways to prepare for the disaster, whether if it's like turning off the lights during a thunderstorm. I know that doesn't seem like the biggest natural disaster or just like taking shelter when there's an earthquake or um, when there's a snowstorm, like making sure that like um, you don't drive when there is like a blizzard because that's quite dangerous unless you really need to get somewhere um, like there's an urgent need, like you need to get, get back home because like there might be a blizzard, that, that sort of thing. Um, another thing, um, I think it was mentioned earlier in the video and like someone did mention it is having um, products like to clean yourself that are fragrance free, especially because like some autistic folks, some people with ADHD may have sensitivity with um, smell. And, you know, sometimes there might be th those on the spectrum or and or with ADHD that have allergic reactions. Um, to those chemicals. So just making sure like you look at the ingredient list of the products you use, making sure you're not allergic to them. Um, I think another thing is like preparing like what you need in case of disaster, like clothes or whatever. I find that with clothes sometimes it is not necessarily the most accessible because some brands um, I can't name them off the top of my head. They have like a tag that's like really attached to your body, which can create sensory issues and it could like, um, impact like how you move, especially for, if you have like limited dexterity. Um, so having like having clothes or like knowing which clothes have like removable tags or if they don't have any tags, it's just like labeled on the clothes itself. I know this is not the most common thing to look out for, but um, having like clothes to wear that are comfortable, that aren't scratchy, just looking at the material use because like you're probably going to be out in shelter or you're going to probably stay in a blizzard for quite a period of time, depending on the duration of disaster. So making sure you're comfortable and that you're not and not feeling like uncomfortable in any sort of way. And just making sure like if you are with someone with sensory needs, you like you make sure that they communicate it to you. And um, like, like if you don't know much about autism and or ADHD, you should probably try to learn it. Um, don't tokenize them. Just try to like get what issues they have. Um, 
if they have issues like following directions either because they're like bouncing off the walls like literally like they literally cannot stand still they can't sit still um or they like have trouble like um looking like they are listening to so maybe they won't look in the eye because they're probably sensitive to it i personally am but some autistic folks are not um so making sure you communicate with them in a way that best suits both of you like maybe you have to reach a compromise but I'm not just saying this for the states, it's like, you know, worldwide, like still like the limit, there is limited knowledge on autism. So if you have someone who is trying to help the autistic person, they're not like a native English speaker, for example, try to like pull up a website that um, gives like a brief overview of autism and what it is and all that sort of thing, because sometimes you know, there may be like communication barriers to due to language, you know, not everybody like speaks English fluently. Um, just, just, just want to keep that in mind. That might be a scenario when you're preparing for a natural disaster. Um, if that's the case, probably have like a translator. If it's like an official or unofficial translator, please have that in hand. Um, but other than that, that's all I have to present for today for inclusive um, sensory needs for those with autism and ADHD. Thank you and I also so forgot much. the wallet cards and the picture cards. Like I, I, I kind of liked that. I was like, oh, I forgot. Like having like those visual cards, like in case like the person goes nonverbal or they're nonverbal. Um, I forgot the other device. It's like an assistive technology device. Um, so I, I don't have that. I don't have much knowledge on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, alternative communication devices for folks yes. who are autistic. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for holding beautiful autistic and ADHD brains in mind as we think about disaster preparedness and how we uphold neurodivergence in the space. Thank you so much, Hannah Gabrielle.